So welcome everyone to lecture number 22. And today we start a new section, which is linked to what we discussed in the case of the tectonic regimes. And finally, we get to talk about the origins and the origins, as I said, are the most challenging parts of, uh, of the, our crust uh, of, the, uh, of the planet. And uh, to understand them, of course, it takes a lot of effort and uh, uh, it's a multi-generational effort. So a lot more to do for you if you are interested in this. So, of course, we'll look at the origins in the context of the models developed uh, within this framework of plate tectonics, uh, which is coherent. And then we we'll look at the types of origins and we'll, we'll discuss today uh, the accretionary origins. So, when we talk about the origins, we talk about major zones that in general are linear uh, of the Earth's crust. Yeah? And what happens uh, in, in these orogenic belts? we find the rocks that had had different stages, underwent different stages of deformation over a long period of time. And then you have a certain distinctive distribution of sedimentary facies of uh, the types of deformation, metamorphic patterns. So you have uh, such patterns very, uh, in most cases, more or less parallel to the belt. And topographically speaking, uh, when they are young or during uh, their formation and um, for a while, you can distinguish them topographically as mountain belts, yeah, because you have crustal thickening and uh, also the process of magmatism, uh, metamorphism, all these processes occur and reoccur during different successive um, tectonothermal events. Tectonothermal means tectonism and thermal events. So, so basically, we call these events orogenies. So within the same belt, we, have, we, we could have several orogenies. Um, so the origin has a, a history. And when people date the, uh, the various minerals, they can see when there was a metamorphosis period that's at, at a certain uh, point in time, and then another metamorphic period, and so on. So these are different orogenies. And eventually, uh, these zones of you know, activity, they uh, get, are part of the crust that gets stabilized. And uh, to keratonize the orogen means it, it becomes part of the craton. That's how the continental crust has been growing. Yeah? We had various uh, orogens that have been added. And eventually, the topographic edifice is uh, eliminated by erosion. But we still have the rocks that show to us that there we had a, an orogenic belt. Like in the, in the shields, uh, if we go where we have the, the rocks exposed, for instance, and we can look at rocks, for instance, in the Canadian shield, and you see zones which were orogens. A very, very famous one is um, here in North America and the eastern part of North America like this, and it goes down to Mexico, actually, the, this origin belt called Granville, 1.1 billion years old. It was like the Himalayas, but it was like the Himalayas 1.1 billion, 100 million years uh, ago. Now, it's like the topography, it's like uh, well, the, uh, that's the idea. The altitude now, it's 300 meters, 400 meters, it's undulating. It's so today you don't see it as a, as a mountain belt, but it's an origin. And we see the roots of the roots that we would see today in the Himalayas. We see these roots exposed in the Canadian Shield and the, the Granville origin. So that's the idea. That's the, the, the way things go are young and then old, and transformations happen. Today, we have two major ones, and you see them. The Alpine Himalayan, and we call it collisional origin, and the Cordilleran accretional origin. Uh, and we'll see today what accretional means. But the idea is that you see these belts are more or less perpendicular. One is east to west, and the other one is north-south, or south-north. Okay, so quite interesting. 
these are the major ones today active. All right, so let's look at this. Um, might might seem oh we have a lot of things here, but um, what what this shows this show, this shows the uh, Wilson cycle, yeah, in a very schematic and I would say cool form. Uh, if you if we start here at one, yeah, at one, let's say you have a continent, it it gets rifted, and it's split apart. And you get a passive margin, yeah, a young ocean. And you see, uh, this uh, stage one could be East Africa today, yeah. Um, Gulf of Suez, yeah. You see North Sea failed drift, but it's no longer uh, extending. But the idea is a young ocean is the Red Sea. Yeah, we we discussed about the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, which continues. Uh, Baja California, yeah, the 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 Gulf of Baja, you, you see this peninsula, Baja California, uh, that belongs to Mexico, and uh, the Gulf there has a uh, has spreading, yeah. So young passive margins, and then the ocean grows, and you have mature passive margins, like in the Atlantic Ocean today. You see, the Atlantic Ocean is very typical for this stage number three, and then stage number four is one somewhere subduction initiates and develops and uh, this is a case of the pacific ocean which is the oldest now so the pacific o ocean has subduction on uh, both sides and uh, eventually the the mid ocean ridges are going to be subducted as well and the ocean starts closing yeah because it undergoes subduction so you see this stage mature subduction early collision so we are talking about things like you see Mediterranean Sea, Black Sea, Caspian Sea. So this zone where actually uh, the, the ocean ha um, has been closing, the Tethys Ocean. So in the end, you end up with two continents or two continental masses colliding and you, you have a continental origin uh, formed through collision. So this would be, and, and as we discussed, this origin eventually the uh, uh, processes there will end will be eroded and we, it will that part of the crust will be part of the craton of the stable continent in India and then the cycle can start again yeah we you see with rifting and so on so you can look at this diagram I think it's pretty good uh, and interesting so this would be the model within the framework of what we discussed or the formation of origins. Now let's look at the types of origins. And we have three end members, three major end members, and you see them here in like in a triangle. Um, something that's called accretionary. And accretionary, you see, it says either intraoceanic or at a continental margin, like here in South America, continental margin. Uh, so basically you have, must have plate margins and you must have oceanic plate subduction and the other plate, the overriding plate could be an oceanic um, lithosphere or it could be continental lithosphere. So here is where the accretionary origins form. Now, this is an intermediate stage because eventually the accretionary origin will become a collisional origin. And that is when in the end the ocean closes and another continental mass uh, reaches uh, the continent where the subduction uh, has been happening and they collide and uh, you form a, an origin like the Himalayas today. Um, and you see the oceanic lithosphere is involved in the case of accretionary origins. When we, we get to the collisional, collisional part uh, stage, we are no longer having an oceanic basin in between. So we have continental pieces that collide. And then at the other end of the triangle, you see something called intracratonic. So basically they lie within a continental mass. So they are not at a plate margin, but uh, remote stresses uh, can uh, reach uh, locations where you, know, you can have um, thickening and uh, origin processes. We'll discuss about um, each of them. So uh, again, these are uh, 
as you can see, schematic cross sections. So now we, we discussed in a very abstract manner. Now you can see the idea of a collisional one is when the oceanic uh, lithosphere is being subducted, all of it. So the ocean closes and you get the two continental masses uh, colliding. And this is the termination of the Wilson cycle. Accretionary is a st this is a stage before this one, the collision one. So you might have, let's say, you might be in the middle of the ocean, yeah, somewhere like in the eastern part of the Pacific, where you have all these island uh, archipelagos, yeah, and you have subduction, and you see uh, this could 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 be happening here. And accretionary means there are various pieces that don't get subducted and get accreted to this. Uh, Orogenic belt, but it could be also the subduction could be here at the continent. Then you have the Andes here. This is accretionary, and interacratonic, as you can see, is basically within the same continent. There are uh, locations where the crust is more unstable in a sense, or weaker, if you want. So it it uh, the remote stresses basically make uh, the crustal thickening possible at some locations. Or I'll sh show you examples of each as we discuss about origins. Uh, so for the rest of, of the class today, we'll look at the accretionary origins. Um, and this is a case for what we have here in South America. So this is something that is of interest to us. And here is what's called lithotectonic elements. So if you look at this, uh, this sketch, you can see things like something called accretionary prism. So accretionary prism, we'll discuss about it, but basically it scrapes the material from the uh, subducting plate. Yeah, So that's um, what happens here. And then because you, you build this accretionary prism here, you see this so-called four arc basin, four arc basin. Um, and then uh, you have basically on the continent, uh, you have the volcanic arc, which would be the uh, arc of volcanoes that extends uh, along the Pacific margin uh, of South America. Yeah. And um, so it would be a volcanic arc, or you can call it a magmatic arc, because it's not only volcanism, it's magmatism. You have plutons that crystallize the depth and so on. And behind it, behind it, we can have two situations. We can have something that's called the fold and thrust belt that we discussed. What happens in the foreland of the Andes? You remember we discussed about this. So you see, I put it as a retro arc, so behind the arc. Or you can have something that is called the back arc basin. I'll show you in what conditions you have a fold and thrust belt and in what conditions you have a back arc basin. And then, here, as, as this uh, plate is being subducted, it may carry, it may carry volcanic arcs, small continental uh, crust uh, fragments, oceanic plateaus. These ones are too buoyant, so they cannot be subducted. So they would be accreted. And that's why we call them accretionary origins. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, we are, we are going to go through all, each of these, so uh, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm going to introduce now to you the concept of terrain. So we can use the word terrain with an I here. Terrain. Uh, uh, after A, you'd have an I, and you would not have E and S. Terrain. And when you use terrain, it has a meaning that you can refer to any piece of the continental crust, this terrain. But when you use the word terrain without I, like here, as it is written here, it has a very clear tectonic significance. And it's this. Uh, these pieces that I was telling you, they can be oceanic plateaus, they can be uh, fragments of continental crust, they can be uh, island arcs. As the, the plate here is being subducted, they travel towards the subduction zone. And when they get here, they clog the subduction zone. They cannot go down. They are too buoyant. 
too thick and too buoyant, so they cannot be subducted. So in this case, what happens, this piece is going to be accreted here. And then as you can see, the subduction has to jump this piece. So basically has to reinitiate on the other side of this piece that cannot be subducted. And, and this piece is being accreted to the continental mass. So that's why the, they are called accretionary orogens for these reasons. So this, uh, these uh, pieces that are accreted, they are called terrains like this, like in the title, in the literature. And um, the, the, you might see the, the word exotic terrain. Exotic means it comes from somewhere else. And basically uh, how people uh, distinguish them, the geologists, they go in the field and how do they distinguish these terrains? They, they have a different structural history and geologic history, different fossil evidence. Well, yeah, no, the, the volcanic arc, yeah, you are uh, asking me what happens with the volcanic arc. Of course, you will, as you can see, uh, very good, uh, David, as you can see, the uh, magmatic or volcanic arc here, the old one, of course, you'd see it moved because this magmatic or volcanic arc is related to the subduction here. You're basically, the plate here um, is dewatered. So the water ascends as it goes deeper. And this creates partial melting in this wedge. So the partial melting is magma that ascends through the crust. So that's good, you're right. Uh, the magmatic art will migrate in response to this. And also how you distinguish this fossil evidence, different fossils that you don't encounter on the, the continent. So you see that that's why they are called exotic terrains, terrains because they are not similar to what we have there. And the idea is that some, sometimes you, uh, when people are finding some elements that indicate that this is not exactly what we have there, but uh, has, are not completely sure, they might say suspect, like here, suspect terrain. Yeah? They have kind of the feeling that it, it came from somewhere else. All right, so now you know a very important term. You'll see it in the literature uh, with, with a very precise meaning. Okay, the most famous example is the North American part of the, uh, of the Americas. Yeah, the North American part of the American uh, Cordillera. It has many suspect terrains. Um, so basically this is a locus of where uh, various species have been accreted. Yeah, um, as the uh, Pacific plate was um, uh, being subducted. So what, what they are, they are a mixture of, you, you can see of metamorphic complexes, volcanic arc material, arc trench deposits. So it's a mixture and you can see them with different colors, what they are, accreted terrains. And this is basically the continental, the ancestral old uh, continental part. Um, so, if someone ever talks about this, the world terrain, just for you to know that in the current situation, this part of British Columbia, for instance, in, in Canada, it's, uh, that's the lo location, yeah? And the Yukon, that's the location where you have this, uh, accredited terrains. All right, now, if we look at the map of the Pacific today, uh, you, what you see here in the middle of the ocean, you see various features like these are um, basically in green oceanic plateaus, yeah? And active island arcs, you see where the subduction takes place. And uh, you can see continental fragments here uh, and various, various things, yeah? Um, inactive island arcs and so on. So these are potentially, the, these are things that in the future will be accreted because for instance, let's, let's look at this, uh, this oceanic plateau or this oceanic plateau. Yeah, so 
if the if the oceanic lithosphere is going to be consumed in here in the Marianas uh, subduction zone, at some point this oceanic plateau will get here and will not be able will not be able to get subducted. So that in the future, in the geologic future, uh, this will be accreted somewhere. So that's the idea of accretion. You see, not many things coming towards South America, not that many as, as they go towards the Eastern part. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there is something here, which is called the Nazca Ridge, which is, um, which might get, you know, fragments accreted. All right, so you get the idea. Now, what happens, and I want to stress again, this process will not go infinitely. At some point, the other side of the ocean will get close to this side of the ocean where the subduction takes place, and the ocean will be consumed, and then you will have collision. So basically, what this says is the accretion origins eventually will suffer a collisional phase. Once this happens, you might have significant modification of the accreted material. Yeah. So basically, you have this collision, which is going to deform the pre-existing rocks. It's going to put new, new imprints, tectonically, uh, thermally, metamorphically. So, so that's what's happening. So um, what was before could be obliterated be obliterated and uh, imagine uh, when we'll talk about the Himalayas but imagine yeah before we had the collision uh, there must have been a subduction so an accretionary origin first and now we, we look at the Himalaya as a collisional origin that's the idea now I we need to to look at an important thing because I was telling you sometimes we have a fold and thrust belt and some other times we have a back arc basin What's the reason for this? You, you have to look here. So we have two end members. One is called a retreating accretionary origin. Um, and the other one is called advancing accretionary origin. Now, I might ask you, which one, <laughs> which one is the case of the Andes? Obviously, it's this one. So um, basically, um, VU, VU here, is the velocity of the uh, underplate, the plate that is subducted. VO uh, is the velocity of the overriding plate, the, the plate that is above. So the situation is like this, you see, VR is larger than VO. What is VR? VR is the slab roll back so you see the slab has an angle but it can retreat and because it can retreat yeah if this velocity is larger than the velocity of the uh, obducting plate this will create a situation of extension uh, of extension uh, in response to the retreat the retreat is faster than than the speed of this and you cannot have a gap here in the earth so basically to accommodate this larger speed the origin is suffering extension so that's how a back arc is being developed because you have a region of extension here uh, in the case like in the case of the andes as you look what what happens vo is larger than the slab rollback and because of this basically you have a compressive re uh, regime and you have the development of the folded thrust belt as we discussed now here, I, I say a, a bit more uh, for each of them. So you can you can read uh, this, but basically this gives you some details uh, about this uh, and some examples where you have these situations. You see Mariana Beccarc Basis, New Caledonia Beccarc Basis. So on the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean on the eastern side, you have these situations, and you have this Beccarc Basis. Now think about we talk about what we have today that we can see. But when you go into the cratons and you look at the old origins that are part of the cratonic crust now, we can recognize zones that were in the past back arc basins. 
and they have certain type of ore deposits like volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits. So that's why we, we, we learn tectonics because by learning tectonics, we know what uh, most of you will be employed as uh, economic geologists. Yeah, you, you'll look for all deposits. So you will know where to go, what type of features to look for that might host uh, economic or deposits. That's the idea. And for advanced ecologians, uh, as you can see, um, this is what happens shortening, uplift. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, and for a fold and thrust belt. All right, South America is the famous region today where we see this. All right, you can uh, uh, read about this. Now, what happens here, and this is something that I called driving mechanisms of orogenesis. So orogenesis means this process of crustal shortening, an accretion and orogen. So what happens? So as you can see, in A, here in A, you have subduction of oceanic lithosphere, but the oceanic lithosphere is not dense enough to have a, a large angle of subduction. It's what's called uh, flat subduction. You see, it's kind of buoyant. So in this case, you might imagine the stresses here. Yeah, you have this coupling, this coupling um, that uh, could be a mechanism that drives orogenesis, drives thrusting. In the case of terrain accretion, which is B, yeah, so we have a little piece that collides, if you want, <laughs> that collides. So obviously this is going to uh, lead to uh, stresses and compression. And um, in the third case, you might have at some point increased convergence. So, so basically this, subducting plate pushes more, or the obducting uh, uh, plate, especially the obducting plate could push more, moves faster, faster, like in the case of the Andes, of the South American continent. So you, you get the formation of the fold and thrust belt. So you might have different situations. And uh, this doesn't mean that the, in the history of an origin, it might not be that at some point you have the formation of a back arc because you have the rollback, which is faster, and then a reorganization of the uh, uh, of the plates, and then the abducting plate comes faster, and then a fold and thrust belt, and back arc closure. So all sorts of combinations. But here we are thinking in terms of mechanics, what would drive the shortening and the thrusting. Yeah. So now that we looked at this perspectives, let's analyze a bit these elements which are important. If you remember, we discussed about the fold and thrust belts, and that's why I said the section before is very much connected to what we discuss now. But I split it a bit so that you have an easier time to, uh, you know, uh, put your new knowledge uh, and assimilate it so that, you know, we don't do tests with a lot of information piece by piece that's the way we all did it so the trench if you look at the trench um, the trenches would have uh, sediments yeah uh, basically you you can imagine what why the trenches have sediments basically because you have the sediments that come down from the um, from the continent on the continental slope and then you have Kind of avalanches, yeah, turbidity currents, as uh, illustrated here, that basically uh, dig submarine canyons, and you have these turbid turbidite fans. So that's in the trench. So you get uh, they are the locations for the turbidites. Yeah, you will hear about the this uh, this type of deposit. All right. Um, the accretionary prism, this is important. We will look a bit, we'll end this class only with the accretionary prism. We won't discuss today the volcanic arc because the accretionary prism, I want you to know a few things about them. Um, so 
the, mechanically speaking, you can understand very easily from such a sketch. You can understand basically, uh, you see how they are formed, how, how they, uh, the, the sediments, the material is scrapped. Yeah. And you see some situations here in this case, there is a trapped, like the subduction basically broke a bit the oceanic lithosphere. There is a little piece of oceanic lithosphere here. And um, basically you, you can have this situation with a four arc basin between the accretionary prism and the volcanic arc, for instance. Or you can have a situation like here, as you can see, and the thrusting divergent, yeah? Divergent thrusting of the material. Um, anyway, here, uh, this might seem a bit kind of esoteric, what I'm trying to see show here. I'll explain it a bit. If you look, uh, let's, let's look first here. This material that is here, if it's the sedimentary material that is on the plate that is being subducted, you'll get here the plate is oldest. So the, the sedimentary pile, yeah, is the largest, the, the thickness of the sedimentary pile. So here, this thing is showing to you what happens with the ocean floor from the point where it is being formed, mid-ocean ridge, to the subduction point here in the trench. So let's think about the sediments here. So if you are right at the mid-ocean ridge here, you can see that you have pillow lava, gabbro. You don't have sediment because it's sediment. Yeah, it's very new. As you move a bit away, you have something called bedded chert. Now, chert is a term for uh, for silica. Silica is uh, like quartz. Uh, it's uh, silicon uh, o silicon oxide. Yeah, it's uh, the most stable like the glass, but the glass we use, video, is basically not, it, it, it's um, amorphous, it's not crystalline. But quartz is crystalline. Now the chert is formed by the fact that we have some very small, very, very small, tiny animals, <laughs> or microorganisms in the oceans called the radiolarians. And what they, when they die, they have this little skeleton, which is silicious and it rains down to the bottom, yeah? We are in the middle of the ocean, it rains down to the bottom. As it accumulates, it, you get this bedded chart, yeah? And then as you get somehow closer towards the continental mass, you get chert. You still have these guys dying and, you know, accumulating there. But also you get some very fine, very fine particles of clastic sediment from the continent, but they are so fine that when they get deposited, they form a mud, yeah? Uh, that's the idea. They form a mud. Uh, it's not like big pieces because they cannot travel. We are still far away. As we get closer to the continent, then we have larger pieces that can make it there, yeah? So this is silty mudstone. You see? So imagine, first you have lava, then you have bedded chert, then you have silicious mudstone with some uh, bedded chert, then you have silty mudstone. And when it gets to the trench, when you get to the trench, you get the turbidite. These are the currents of sandstone, uh, of, of sand, uh, the currents of sand that flows down the continental uh, slope and they get deposited on top of the other sediments. So imagine a column like this here where the ocean is, uh, oceanic lithosphere is oldest. So here the sedim sedimentary column will include all this. And this sedimentary column is scraped and is preserved in the accretionary prism. So you might get a piece here and when you go and look at it, you see the various, the various layers yeah, of these sediments that were accumulated as the uh, oceanic plate traveled towards the continent in time. So this is what the accretionary prism contains. 
Okay. Now we understand basically the type of rocks that compose it. Now let's look a bit at what happens in the accretion of prism. And it's a, uh, it's a bit uh, crazy because uh, the accretion of prism has also uh, tectonic crosses under those, you know, uh, because of this scraping, obviously you will have thrust faults and folds as well, thrust faults. On top here, gravity sliding. So you might have pieces, pieces of uh, sediment that would, will slide down the slope. Yeah. Um, and when the prism is very thick, very thick, then, then it will collapse under its own weight. So you'll develop some normal faults. So in the end, you might think, okay, so many things going on that in terms of structures, it, it's gonna be like crazy, a mix of things. And this is what it is. It is a mix of things. All right, so, so um, that's why accretionary prisms are very extremely complex. And for mapping them, I'll show, I'll show you some examples. So let's look at this. There is downslope movement. Yeah, downslope movement of slump blocks. Yeah, but these blocks can be very big, can be meters to kilometers across. Yeah, uh, and they slide, they slide down. And the, this big piece that slides down uh, stays more or less coherent as it slides down. Of course, it might break a bit and so on, but it's not completely destroyed. So it's semi coherent. These pieces are called olistostroms. You'll find this term. When I grew up in Romania, I was going to the Carpathians and I was going to ski in the winter and so on. And I was looking at some of these pieces and they are olistostroms, yeah? They are these big pieces that slid down, yeah, along the slope. And they are semi-coherent that they contain blocks of different sizes and so on. So for instance, um, anyway, if we think about the comp combination of tectonic deformation, which is normal, yeah, you have the thrusting, slumping, extensional collapse, you can imagine that structurally, if you are sent to map an accretionary prism, you are going to say, oh my God, this is going to be extremely challenging, very difficult. So, um, you might see parts of the of, of the accretion priest where you have coherent strata yeah the the whole package was basically thrust and preserved you might have parts where you get a mix of things and these are called a melange because melange in in the french language means what uh, uh, um, a mixture of things and in espanol i think it is a mescla. Hmm? So it's a chaotic mixture of things. All right. So that's the idea. And here, if you were to look at different parts and zoom in, so let's see. In this part of the accretion reprise, if you look, it says sedimentary tectonic melange. So you get sedimentary parts, but tect so uh, things that slid down, as you can see, these semi coherent uh, uh, blocks. But also tectonic, you see the thrust faults. If you were to look here, it's sedimentary melange. So are these blocks that slid down? Here it shows what's called a mud volcano. You see a mud volcano because uh, the sediments under high pressure here they dewater, and suddenly there is an explosive dewatering. Yeah, and you get these mud volcanoes. So. If you look at the sedimentary tectonic melange, you see from Costa Rica. And look at this. You can see a, a, a mixture of things. You see limestone and basalt and radiolarite is this rock formed from the, from the skeletons of the very tiny animals. So you might think, what is this basalt doing here with the limestone, with the radiolarite? So you can imagine the whole initial architecture was completely destroyed and mixed. This is a melange. All right, so 
you might get basalt is like the piece of the oceanic crust, yeah, for instance. So here is a, a, a description, you see, of the melange. So I told you when we talked about the fold and thrust belts uh, as well, I told you that in Iran, that in Iran we have one which is very famous. Um, but also you can look at uh, in the Macron accretionary complex in Iran. Uh, and these people try to show an olistostrom here. So you see on top of something they call oligocene sandstones, they get this, uh, this piece that contains blocks of different sizes and so on, but which slid down, yeah? And it's more or less uh, semi-coherent. You see, it's a chaotic non-metamorphic formation. You have turbidites, you have a shaley matrix, uh, all sorts of things, blocks of different compositions. This is a famous one. Here, uh, if you go to Newfoundland in uh, an island in, on the eastern side of Canada, you see a Paleozoic melange. When you look at it, I mean, what is this? No co coherence here. I mean, a, a mix of things. But this is what happens in these accretionary prisms. You can imagine how complex the processes are. So, uh, in addition to what we discussed, in addition to what we discussed, uh, there is basically a long term, what's called internal circulation of material. Yeah. So, we talked about dewatering, for instance. But anyway, the idea is that the material here can be entrained. So you can see something here at the base at some point can be pushed up along one of these thrust faults. Yeah. And what happens, this is maybe the most important thing I want you to know about the accretionary prisms. It says, um, so when we look at old accretionary prisms, we find, find something that's called blue schist. What is blue schist? Now, the blue schist is a rock, it's a metamorphic rock, which forms at the base of the accretionary prisms here. Under conditions of low temperature and very high pressure. You can imagine what the pressure is here, how, you know, what the pressure of this thing kind of sliding down under this obducting plate, and you have this wedge of sedimentary uh, material, and there you have conditions of high pressure. But this material eventually is lifted up, it circulates, so uh, basically you can get to the surface of the edge when, when the pressure is not that high, you get this rock called blue schist, which is formed at the base of the prism because you have this circulation of material. And this, again, contributes to the melange. Anyway, um, a bit about the blue schist. It would look like this. The, the reason uh, it's called blue, you see the blue color, the blue color, you have this mineral called glaucophane. It is an amphibole, it's a sodium amphibole and it forms at, at this pressure. And this pressure corresponds to about 20 kilometers of burial. So 20 kilometers is a lot. So at that pressure, this mineral forms. So this metamorphic rock includes this mineral, which is bluish. And basically it, this rock, this type of metamorphic rock forms only at the base of accretionary prisms. So if you are a geologist and you go and map a region, and if you find blue schists, then you know that that region has been and was in the past an accretionary prism. This is a very important thing. When people tell you about blue schists, you know, and a very famous place uh, to see blue schists uh, is the region of the San Francisco and Silicon Valley on the coast. There, there you have a complex, a very famous complex where you can find blue schists, for instance. All right, so, so this is the story of the blue schists. And the last slide, 
because I think I, I've told you many things and I want you to have time to assimilate them. This is something that you haven't seen yet because you haven't taken the petrology class with Marcos. <laughs> and Marcos is teaching igneous petrology, but I think he's teaching metamorphic petrology as well because metamorphism is very important. In metamorphism, and I'm anticipating a bit so that you know a bit that you can link things. In metamorphism, as you can see, we care about the transformation of pre existing rocks under conditions of temperature and pressure. And normally, in the uh, deep parts of the mountain uh, ranges of the origins, we have what's called the regional metamorphism. And we, we have evolution of rocks in what's called normal. Uh, normal metamorphism, you see two and three here show paths of how the rocks would evolve as they get buried. From diagenesis, they go through various fields of pressure and temperature and they get transformed to the, for instance, this is the green schist phases. So you may have heard about the rocks in the green schist phases, amphibolite phases, and the most intense metamorphic transformation, granulite phases. But you have some extremes between this typical path that happens in the orogenic belts, and this is a regional metamorphism. You have the situation which you see as one here, which is called contact metamorphism. That means high temperature, low pressure. Imagine a pluton, a pluton being in place in the crust and the rock next to it is going to be baked <laughs> by the pluton. So the rock basically suffers contact metamorphism and the new rock that is being formed is called a hornfeld, as you can see it here. We have the, op the other end member, low temperature, but high pressure. And this is the base of the accretionary process. And here are the conditions of blue schist formation. So now you can have a perspective. You can see the paths here that you see green schist, amphibolite, granulite. This is when you talk about the metamorphism that happens basically in the deep parts of the orogenic belts, yeah, uh, under the volcanic arcs where, where you have collision origins. But on each side, you have this situation when we talk about plutons and the way they bake the rocks around them, or we can talk about the situations, the conditions at the base of the accretionary prisms and the formation of blue schists. So I think you learned some new things in this class. I hope you find it interesting. I, I hope that the pieces of the puzzle and all the hardship from the beginning with structural geology and all these things start to coalesce into a, a nicer picture. I hope so, right? So, <laughs> yes, you're welcome, uh, Maria Camila. This being said, um, actually, no, one more thing, one more thing, sorry for, um, for this. Um, I want to uh, show you here, um, no, not this one, sorry. Um, what you have to what you have to read not much uh, just from here oops uh, from chapter 17 in this book a few pages yeah uh, with the concepts we discussed this is it uh, so thank you to all of you for you know what we uh, discussed today uh, thank you for being here with me today uh, David Gabriel Juan Daniel Maria um, and if you have questions, we can discuss the geology. If you don't, and if you have a few minutes and you would like to talk a bit about the current situation in Colombia, you are more than welcome to, to stay here a bit. So thank you very much to all of you. You are welcome. From the other book, Gabriel? No, uh, no, I've, uh, uh, I'm giving you just from this book. Uh, they explain pretty well. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, uh, David. So if you don't have to, uh, if you don't have questions, it's up to you. If you want to leave, no problem. If you want to stay a bit, 
let me know and we can have a chat.